After building the hood, I had to find a way of securing it in the raised position. Some kind of aluminum railing that would hold it at the right height and that would hold it close to the walls of the lower level so as to reduce the space for ingression of mosquitoes and black flies. On my trip to the local building supply store, I found what looked like the ideal material. A narrow aluminum U-channel like this quarter inch wide channel. It came in 4 foot lengths, so I bought one and cut it in half, 24 inches for each side. I drilled 5 holes through both sides of the channel. I enlarged the outer hole to allow a screwdriver to access the screw, then I beveled the inner hole to allow the screw head to be recessed. The exact driblet sizes are specified in the plans. I lowered the hood to the appropriate level and marked the location of the channel on each side before lifting the hood and screwing the channels in place. After using the camper for a while, the bottom edge of the hood started to show fraying like in this clip. In an attempt at protecting the edges without adding any significant thickness, I applied aluminum tape to the edges like this. Unfortunately, my strategy didn't work. The damage occurred because the soft coroplast was catching on the sharp edges of the U-channel when the hood was lowered. So this is how I resolved the issue. I removed the channels, placed them in a vise, and bent out the outside side as illustrated in this diagram. For that operation, I used a flat pry bar. This enlarges the opening, thus making it easier for the edge of the hood to enter the channel, therefore reducing abrasion. I'm not happy about the appearance of the widened channel, but the main thing is that it's functional. If I were to build a new camper, and if I had difficulty sourcing the quarter inch wide channel, I would try angle aluminum and bend it to give it this shape. In fact, this might be a better option. After having installed the hood support rails, I needed to find a way to pull the hood forward so the rear second level wall would be tight against the side walls and to hold the hood in place so it wouldn't lift up and blow away in a strong wind. First I had to reinforce the coroplast side by hot gluing a piece of aluminum sheet near the front of the hood as highlighted here. Then I drilled a hole in the bottom of the aluminum sheet right through to the second level wall header for introducing a retaining pin. I repeated the same operation on the other side of the camper. Next step was to install the nylon waterproofing strips. There's information on how to make the nylon waterproofing strips in the plans. Before installing the strips, I placed a few tabs of self-adhesive industrial grade male velcro on the edge of the front wall. Then I placed the nylon strip in place with its outside edge over the velcro tabs near the top of the wall. I then applied a strip of duct tape the whole length of the waterproofing strip to hold it in place. It's surprising how well duct tape sticks to nylon. Here I'm installing the retaining pin for the hood. The plans explain how to make a securing pin and its lanyard. The left side retaining pin is now in place on the hood. I needed to find a way of holding the rear wall and the side walls together. At first I installed screen door hooks on the inside. It was awkward to clip them closed and they didn't hold the walls very firmly. So eventually I thought of securing pins, like those at the front. Here I'm drilling a hole through the studs of the rear and left sidewall. The pin serves to hold the sidewall steady. This shows the left rear retaining pin in place, preventing the sidewall from moving in or out. 
The plans describe how to make the hood guidance flap. This clip shows me screwing it in place at the top of the front wall. Its coroplast hinge allows it to bend upward and downward. It was only after the first season was over that I installed the fender. The plans show how to build the fender. Just in case the design of the fender creates unexpected problems, I'm installing it with duct tape, which could easily be removed. This picture shows the way the tow bar support is attached to the underside of the frame and how the tow bar is attached to the side of the tow bar support. You can see two large bolt heads under the tow bar support which are fastened to the frame. You can see the two bolts that connect the tow bar to the tow bar support. This diagram, taken from the plans, shows a side view of the tow bar support. This sequence shows the leveling blocks which are one inch and an eighth thick on the right side, starting from the front panning to the rear. These are attached to the bottom of the frame and serve to make up for the thickness of the axle mounts and the tow bar which are each one inch and an eighth thick. This winter I installed a vent and a large louver at the back of the hood to improve ventilation on hot days. This shows how the louver opens. It works on the same principle as the window awning, but with a single wire opener. Here we're having a look at the vent from the inside with the louver in the closed position. We see the wire opener, which is fully retracted and held in place against a retaining screw. When the hood is raised to the vertical position, it leans backwards because the hinge is higher than the ground. That's the case because the frame is raised an inch and an eighth above the ground. To keep the hood vertical when it is raised, I've added a ground clearance block at the top of each side. At first I made the blocks two inches deep, but I've recently cut them down to one inch deep. Now the hood leans backwards slightly, so I guess the ideal would be an inch and a quarter. At some time in the summer, I noticed an arc of scuff marks on the left side of the hood. Although there's an inch distance between the wheel and the side of the trailer, somehow, under conditions I don't know, the hood must have bulged out and touched the wheel while underway. The wind? I don't know, it could be the wind. But I found a way to prevent this from happening by installing a device to prevent the hood from bulging out, which I'm calling a hood bulge preventer. It's simply a small metal angle brace screwed to the underside of the trailer near the wheel. The angle brace is bent out to a suitable angle with a pry bar or a flat screwdriver. Have a look at the effect when the hood is lowered. One of the advantages of designing the camper so the wheels must be removed is that it brings the floor close to the ground. That made it very easy to add an extension on the entrance side. An integral part of the Barrio Collapsible Bicycle Camper is the nylon vestibule which greatly increases the livable area. It provides room for my gear and protection from the rain, but when it's pulled out like an awning, it provides protection from the sun. When came the time to make the vestibule, I looked up tent makers. I found only one person in all of the Ottawa Gatineau area who works with the thin material camping tents are made of. 
I discussed my needs with him, but I couldn't quite make out what he was thinking. My impression is that he thought I was nuts to think that I can make a camper that can be pulled by a bicycle. To be able to give me an estimate, he would need a precise plan on paper, and he'd have to do some research to source the kind of nylon needed for the purpose, and he couldn't begin to look into it for at least two weeks. It was late June, and I couldn't afford to waste any time. So my wife volunteered to do her best with her sewing machine. I got some 70 denier polyurethane coated nylon from Fabricville, and we set ourselves to work. As far as tents go, my vestibule was quite a simple design. It would consist of only four parts, one rectangle, two triangles plus a zipper. Not knowing how to go about this, I attached a rectangular piece of the nylon to the top of the camper temporarily with duct tape, then stretched it out and measured what would be a suitable length. Then I measured the triangular parts. Michelin sewed everything together and hemmed all the edges. She made a long pocket the whole width of the bottom of the rectangular piece to accommodate a wooden slat to give the fabric rigidity to enable rolling it up. She then made a vertical cut near the entrance and installed a zipper to enable entering and exiting the vestibule. Finally, strips of one inch wide female velcro were sewn along the vertical edges of the two triangles and strips of one inch wide industrial grade self-adhesive male velcro were stuck to the camper as shown here. The top edge of the vestibule was hot glued to a strip of coroplast. Then the vestibule was attached to the top of the hood with a coroplast strip on the outside of the nylon fabric. Three pairs of male-female combo velcro were screwed to the top of the vestibule, one of each pair underneath the nylon, and the other one of each pair on top of the coroplast strip. To keep rain from penetrating under the vestibule, the top of the coroplast strip was waterproofed with duct tape. To facilitate raising the hood to put it in position at the top of the walls, a cabinet handle was screwed to the top of the hood in the middle of the left side. To reduce the chances of the camper capsizing in a gale force wind, a tether is attached to the hood lifting handle and pegged to the ground with a length of parachute cord, as you can see here. To make the trailer more visible to traffic on the road, among other things, I've attached a bicycle flag to the back on the left side. For this I'm using two screw eyes, one angle brace, and an R-type clip as you can see here. I've added silver self-adhesive reflecting tape at the front, and at the back I've installed red reflector tape on the sides and a pair of reflector lenses and a red light on the back wall. To keep the stinging critters outside when I'm inside my camper, I made a screen closure for the entrance. After cutting to size a piece of lightweight screening material that I bought at Fabricville, Michelin folded and pinned the edges to enable her to sew the hem. She sewed a strip of female velcro to the top and I hot glued magnets on the sides. A strip of self-adhesive industrial grade male velcro at the top of the entrance serves to hold the screen in place. Steel plates hot glued to the sides of the doorway enable the screen to stay in place with its magnets. Using a scrap of galvanized steel, I cut out small squares to be hot glued to the sides of the doorway for the magnets to hold the screen in place. This is a demonstration of how to hot glue metal plates to Coroplast. Glued 
two pieces of scrap chloroplast together with hot glue. And it's so strong a bond that I can't tear it apart. This is a demonstration of how to make a bend in chloroplast. We start by drawing a line and we're going to use a screen door spline roller tool uh, for making the scores required for making the bend. So we start by placing our ruler a little bit on the outside of the line because we're going to make a score on both sides of the line. We're going to make two scores, one on each side of the line. So hold your ruler very steady and press firmly with the roller and make small passes back and forth. This, this way. If the ruler moves, push it back in place and make it fairly, until you feel that it's fairly deep and then we'll make a score on the other side of the line. So reposition your ruler so that the next score mark will be on the other side. And again, we make short passes by pressing hard downwards. And we do the whole length. And once we feel that it's, it's dug in there, you can feel that it has actually dug in. Put your ruler on the line and lift up and there we are. That's, that's your bend. It's a little springy, but for making a box, uh, it's just a perfect way of, of having two of the parts or three of the parts joined together. Begin by assembling the box temporarily with masking tape or duct tape. Now that the pullet is fully assembled with duct tape, we're going to see whether it fits or not in the space that's allocated. Now I see that it's a little bit too tight on the front side. It, it, it protrudes a little too much on the inside here. So I'm going to trim the top of this wall here a little bit. Whereas the other side here is pretty good. Uh, it's pretty tight, but I think it goes in well enough that I don't need to make any more adjustments on this one. Here I was preparing to hot glue the box together. What you need is a glue gun of at least 100 watts since a very hot temperature is required. You want all-purpose hot glue designed for 410 degrees Fahrenheit. Hot gluing coroplast is more like soldering than welding. With soldering, you're melting a second metal to bond with two pieces of like metal. With hot gluing coroplast, the glue bonds to each piece and holds them tightly together. The trick to obtaining a strong bond is to go slowly. Slow and steady wins the race. The gun puts out two to four grams of glue per squeeze. After you've given it a squeeze, you have to release the trigger, let it spring back, and then squeeze slowly again. Later I found out that it helps to make a more even bead if you prop up the box to a 45 degree angle, which makes perfect sense. Another factor is the width of the bead. The wider bead makes a stronger joint than a thinner one. After each 10 to 12 inches of gluing, stop and wait for at least 2 minutes to allow the gun to reach its maximum temperature. Since coroplast is a poor conductor, it takes a while for the glue to cool completely. 
I realized right from the get-go that it would take some kind of stopper to prevent the pullout from falling out of the opening when extracting it. To prevent that from happening, I installed two small wooden stoppers like this at the top. But that wasn't enough. I then added stoppers made from angle braces at the bottom of each side. But that wasn't enough. Occasionally, if the pullout tilted while I was pulling it out, the two stoppers at the top would clear the opening and the pullout would get stuck partially outside the camper. So this is how I solved the problem. I attached a section of 1 inch by 1 inch angle aluminum, 9 inches long, on each side with pop rivets. And this, I think, will work perfectly well. As you can see, I work very much by trial and error. If necessity is the mother of invention, well, trial and error certainly must be its father. I'm using self-adhesive V-Flex window seal for sealing the sides and the top of the openings of the pullouts to keep the rain out. It's a matter of removing the peel-away strip and applying the ribbon so that it protrudes about an eighth to three sixteenths of an inch from the edge into the opening. The material is very flexible and forms a perfect seal around the pullout when it's in the extracted position. This shows all three sides sealed. Since V-Flex doesn't adhere very well to Coroplast, it needs to be held in place with duct tape stuck on top of it. Originally, the flip-down panel at the entrance was as wide as the height of the first level wall. This is the new flip-down platform door, which folds in the middle. It's made from 10 mm thick Coroplast, which provides a wider area at ground level than the original. It can be flipped up to act as a door to close and lock the entrance. This clip shows how the platform door is attached to the camper. An intermediate piece of 4 mm thick Coroplast is hot glued and riveted to the thick Coroplast. A groove three quarters of an inch from the edge of the intermediate piece is scored with a spline roller to form a hinge. Then it is screwed to the underside of the frame. The plans show details of construction. For the locking mechanism, I'm using a regular hasp. I started with a 4 inch hasp, but after having installed the male part to the hood, I realized that the female part was too short to reach, so I had to replace the female part with a 6 inch one. In retrospect, the method I used was unnecessarily complicated. I formed a depression in a piece of reinforcement aluminum sheeting and placed the male part of the hasp through a hole behind the plate. That was very time consuming. If I were to start over, I would simply hot glue a plate about 3 inches square to the hood as reinforcement and I would place the male part on top of the aluminum and secure it in place with pop rivets inserted from behind the coroplast. This shows the female part being pop riveted to the platform door. One very easy to make feature that I like about the camper is that I can add shelves for storage or to use as a table when bad weather forces me to eat indoors. Since I had plenty of 10 mm thick coroplast left over after having made my platform door, I made new shelves out of this material. It's 20% lighter than quarter inch plywood. Finally, here is a picture of the splash preventer. It consists of a piece of coroplast screwed to the top of the two hood descent delimiters. It serves to keep the inside of the hood dry when traveling on wet roads. This marks the end of this five-part series on how I built my collapsible bicycle camper. 
I hope it was instructive whether or not you are building one yourself. If you would like to receive a set of plans for building one of your own, I've made the plans available completely free of charge. You can find the information on how to obtain them by going to my website www.robertberio.com. Thank you for watching and follow your dreams.